Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us here. I am sitting today with Temba Maseko, the author of uh, For My Country. It's an account of why he blew the whistle on the Zumas and the Guptas. It's a, an interesting book. It's a book I think every South African should read. Um, and I thank you all for joining us. I firstly want to say thank you as always to all the Maverick Insiders. Um, you are very special to us and, and we appreciate you very much. Then to the Konrad Adenhauer Stiftung who ensured that we could host this webinar. Thank you to you. Ntate Temba, welcome. Hi, good afternoon, Paula. There are people all around the country and I see some across the world as well that logged in to have a chat with you and to see what you say. So we are very excited to have you here. I'm going to jump right in um, because you had li lived a, a very interesting and full life up to now. Um, you had a front row seat um, as an eyewitness at every seminal development in South Africa since the 70s. In 76, you, was, you were a child uh, student in Soweto when a bunch of policemen started shooting live ammunition into groups of school children um, after they complained because they couldn't understand maths and science in Afrikaans. You started as a, your career as an activist right then, but you also became part of student activism. Um, you considered to go into exile later. You were arrested and tortured by the apartheid policemen before you could do so. Then you lived through the Rubicon years. Um, there's this delightful account of how you and your wife, Bendile, were the first to move into an all-white suburb and how they were quite hostile still at the time. Mm -hmm. um, you also lived through the first democratic elections. Um, you were one of the youngest members in Madiba's cabinet. And then you saw how it all went pear shaped. Um, you witnessed Mbeki's brilliance in cabinet meetings, but you also witnessed the suspension of the then head of prosecutions, Busi Pikoli, over independence issues. You witnessed the death of the Scorpions. You witnessed the rise of Jacob Zuma as president of the country. You served government and the people in all sorts of roles since that very first bullet maybe that was shot at you and your fellow students way back in 76 in Soweto. The last was as head of government communications. Um, and again, you were an eyewitness um, of the Guptas and their many attempts to capture the state, to dictate to you and to dictate to other directors general and cabinet ministers. Now, why did you write the book? You went to the Zondo Commission to tell your story. You went to um, Minister Gwedi Mantash to tell your story. What is your message with this book? Well, let me deal with your first question. Why did I write the book? Um, my sense is that in most revolutions, revolutionaries or activists who participate in the actual struggles often don't tell their stories. They, they leave their stories to people like yourselves, uh, journalists and, and other observers. And in my view, I think it's absolutely vital that people who were in the trenches, people who participated in struggles must be able to share their story, stories for posterity sake so that future generations don't only know what happened, but how it happened. And most importantly, how it affected individuals who were participating in the struggle. So that's why I decided to, to write the book. And I'm encouraging as many activists as possible to actually share their stories so that history is told not just from the perspective of observers, but it's told from the perspective of the actors, the actual actors themselves. Why I went to the Zondo Commission, basically I got extremely concerned about the unfolding state capture project in the country. And initially my exchange with President Zuma, I will admit that in fact, um, I did not see that necessarily as whistle blowing initially. It was just a question of defiance. I was willing to defy the most powerful person in the country, in the ANC, because I did not agree with what he was asking me to do with regard to the Guptas. It took me a couple of years to actually speak out. And, and that's when mm. I decided to become a, a whistleblower. And I went to the public protector. I went to, I became the only person who went to the ANC to share my story with Zuma and the Guptas. But I thought the Zondo Commission, and recall, remember that um, 
a group of DGs had actually called for the establishment of a judicial commission of inquiry. And as those DGs would agree that we're going to speak out. So when the commission was set up, I decided I will be among the first to actually go and appear and tell the story. Because I understood that the Zondo Commission was going to very, play a very important part in exposing corruption in general, but state capture in particular. And I thought my story could actually fill in a, a missing gap that people did not know what was happening in the country. So that's why I decided to go. Absolutely, and it did. Um, I see another whistleblower, Cynthia Stimple, logged in as well. She was at SAA, uh, mm. and uh, she says congratulations for the book because she's gone through much um, of the themes that you did. And we will go to what whistleblowers actually go through when they decide to blow the whistle. Um, but I must say, I've, I've worked with with very many. Some of them came out and some of them didn't. But what you describe in your book are really classic symptoms of whistleblowing, the depression, the self-isolation, the unwelc being unwelcome in your former home structures, the joblessness, um, the, the fact that you're being pushed out. It's it's classic. And I want uh, we want we will go deep deeper into that later. I want to remind everyone who's locked in uh, that you can ask questions and we will do our best to field some of those. Okay, so I have around four themes that I want to discuss with you in Tate Temba um, and they're all building on each other. So we'll talk, take them in order from the start. Okay. So growing up in Soweto, um, it didn't, I, I don't want to talk about the courage to stand up to policemen because we all know what courage that took. Uh, I want to talk about the courage that was actually much more difficult to, to find in yourself, which I think was the courage to succeed. You describe being the first person in your family to receive a degree. You describe the hunger um, that you often had to live with and your classmates often had to live with. You describe how your neighbor um, took you in one day and how it was the first time that you sat around a table um, having a meal. You describe sleeping on the ground and how normal it was for you. You describe how you flunked standard seven, uh, grade nine um, in current language with some inspiration from a local nun. The next year you got second best marks in your class. She got you into one of the best Suetan schools consequentially. Um, and then you speak about how you studied through the night, taking a blanket to school, staying there, and then going home because home conditions weren't conducive to studying. Tell yeah. me about that time. I think it was a, a difficult time, and I, I, I would imagine it's a, con, it's a it's a time that most black South Africans go through, especially young people. Um, I had a very deep desire to get good quality education, inspired by both my parents who never had an opportunity to go to school. So they did their best to support me, but um, the conditions were indeed difficult. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I must say that um, <clears throat> after education was disrupted in Soweto, following the uprising, age, going to school was, was, was quite a mission. Um, and, and when I flung school, it was because we had actually not been in class for the better part of that particular year. So we wrote exams and, and I failed. And that I recall that I was extremely depressed. For the mm -hmm. first time in my student career, I had actually failed. So my neighbor, Oscar Line, actually found me sobbing outside her home. And she took me in and actually tried to motivate me and inspired me to say, go back to school. If you do well, I'll find you a place in a better school, which was a, a one of the two Catholic schools in Soweto. And that's how I basically managed to pass my matric uh, with decent results. And um, <clears throat> unfortunately, at the time, there wasn't, there wasn't any clear guidance for, for black kids. Um, in my home, nobody had gone beyond matric. So I was, in a sense, not just in my home, my family, but in my extended family, I was the first person to get a matric exemption to qualify to go to varsity. And that's when I decided I'm going to go to VETS and try and apply. Unfortunately, VETS rejected me on the basis that I needed to get ministerial approval to study at VETS. And the minister at the time was F.W. De Klerk, who actually rejected my application. I then ended up going to university. But my experience as VETS was quite uh, significant. And what's interesting is that 
most of the challenges that black students are experiencing uh, in universities across the land are the same experiences that we went through. Um, lack of accommodation, not having money to pay, to buy school fees, no food, uh, battling to cope with the academic pressures that came that we were experiencing at the time at VETS, and then participating in protests, fighting with the cops, cops raiding campus, firing tear gas. So when I see the Fees Must Fall movement, for example, I'm actually reminded of the experiences that I went through as, as a youngster. And it shows you that as a country, we still face many, many of the challenges that students are facing today. Sadly, it's more than 20, 20 years after our liberation. The challenges that we experienced then, when I was a kid at school, when I was a, a student in, at university, is the same challenges that uh, students are experiencing today. Mm. That is such an important point, and you're actually um, leading me right into my next question, because what I wanted to ask you then is, why are we still struggling with these issues? We are um, deep into our liberation now. We are supposedly a free nation. But the Eastern Cape, there was a report the other day that said that um, almost 1,600 schools are still without toilets in the school. They have to have pit toilets or they have to make a plan somehow. I mean, that is just one of the conditions that these people must face when they, when they want a proper education. Um, and I think you can tell us so much about what, how much courage, how much conviction, how many people at the right time you need to meet to actually make something of yourself and actually to become the Tenba Maseko of the world. Uh, why is it, and you, you spend time at the education departments of Gauteng yourself, why is it that, we, that we're still here? And at that point, I, I wonder if we shouldn't criticize government more. What do you think? I think that, you know, in 1994, after the first democratic elections in the country, we had, in a sense, some kind of a leap of faith, so to speak, because we're the generation of activists who were determined, we had a vision to transform our society. A lot of us got into government. A, a lot of us became ministers and directors general. We had a period where there was focus, undivided focus on the part of the new government then, to make sure that we transform society, we address the challenges that the nation was facing. And a lot of new policies came into place, new structures. I mean, I was responsible for establishing the Gauteng Education Department from four racially based education departments to a single one. And the team of people I had in my department were, were so single-mindedly focused on changing the lot of our students in all our schools. Um, we then went through a period in the country where there was too much changes happening uh, with the complexity in the political sphere, especially within the ruling party. You saw an exodus of people from government who were being either moved out, kicked out or fired. And that led to a major brain drain in, in, in government. And we had a situation where new blood was coming in, but also as ministers were changing in the public service, you also had new cadres of ministers coming in, and instead of carrying on from where the previous crowd left, new initiatives started. So there wasn't continuity. So there was a lot of intellectual capital that was lost during that period. And, and, and I think that we, we, we lost, lost track. So after every cabinet reshuffle, after every general election, you'd if almost think that there's a, a new party that was in place, that there isn't continuity of, of uh, work that had been done before. Obviously then corruption comes into the picture where a lot of the people who end up in government tend to, tended to focus more on lining their pockets. That is mm -hmm. how much money they could make out of the public uh, service uh, system. So you had corruption allegations against people from municipal level, provincial government, even to national government. And with that corruption, this is where our society, I think, needs to do a bit of education because people aren't able to establish the link between corruption and poor service delivery. The fact that money is being stolen means that government is having less and less resources available to, to build those toilets in schools, to fix our education system, to pay more salaries to teachers, to employ more police and train them. Money is being siphoned out of the, the public purse for corrupt ends. And that's 
primarily the reason why I think we are losing the plot somehow as, as a nation. And I think we need to begin to refocus again and make sure that government spends each and every cent, each and every minute in, in, in the country to actually improve the lot of South African citizens. Mm. Okay, I hear you saying that there's structural problems. I hear you saying that there's corruption problems. I hear you saying that, um, that there's not enough knowledge in um, departments to ensure that everything goes right. Okay, so how do we fix it? Because I, I really do think this education problem is um, one of the biggest threats to South Africa and no child should go through what you have gone through. And still we find themselves or ourselves um, writing about this, discussing this, and this is the year 2021. Uh, how do we fix it? Well, I think there, there needs to be single-minded focus on all the stakeholders, your teachers, government officials, parents associations, to, to make sure that we begin to address the issues of resource allocation. Um, and a lot of it has to do with making sure that you provide sufficient resources, especially to poor schools, to make sure that you provide facilities. Secondly, focus needs to be placed on providing support and training of teachers so that we can give them not just the skills, but the confidence to deliver quality education, especially in the township schools and, and rural schools, because the truth of the matter is that kids, your kids and mine who go to middle class kind of schools are receiving decent quality education. The majority mm -hmm. of students in the township or black schools aren't receiving quality education largely because we do not have properly trained teachers. There aren't enough resources that are in place. And there's just too much policy adjustments and policy changes. And we're just not focusing on delivering quality education in the classroom. So we need to stabilize the policy environment, create policy sensitivity as far as, for example, your curriculum. There can be too many changes in the curriculum because in the process you are losing out on your teachers who, who should be delivering uh, that quality curriculum in, in the classroom. And as we are changing these curriculum issues, not enough time is spent on training teachers to make sure that they are on board. And this is creating a situation where even teachers who are, who are teaching in township schools are taking their kids out of those township schools to your former model schools because they themselves do not have confidence of the education that they are giving to kids in the township schools. So it's those kinds of issues, resource allocation, teacher training, curriculum certainty, and I think that will go a long way towards stabilizing our education system. Mm. And I would also encourage every listener to do something active about education in the country. Um, we can't go on like this and we need people. It will solve a lot of problems that we have currently if we can solve the education problem. Yep. Unfortunately, we need to step off of that subject, but I want to talk to you about betrayal. It's something that you mentioned twice, about twice in your book, but um, it, there are actually many examples. Um, one of them was this, well, Betrayal is a central theme in your book, and one of them, I think, was Captain Eugene de Kock way back in the apartheid years and the operation codenamed Cobra, where some of your friends or colleagues or, or um, uh, people that you knew were killed as student leaders um, and how you were almost one of them. Can you recount that story for us? Well, as an activist, especially during the, the mid to late 80s, I mean, a lot of us lived with the knowledge that there's a plate out there with your name written in it. So there is, will always be attempts at your life. So in that particular case, I was a, a student leader in the Azanian student organization, and I was also one of the links between the, the student organization and the ANC in exile. So we got a call to say the ANC wants a meeting with us in Swaziland. And because I was a contact person, I was one of the contact persons, we became suspicious of that request. Now, one of our comrades was actually the one who was facilitating this trip. So I tried to make contact with my contacts in Lusaka. And when I finally got the, con the contact, it was confirmed that in fact, there was no such a meeting. And unfortunately that activists continued to organize other st students. A few of us as student leaders decided 
we're not going to go on the trip. I mean, it was a Saturday morning. I still remember vividly when he came to my house to fetch me to go on this trip. And I'd spoken to a few of my comrades and I told him that I'm not going. And I gave him some reasons, but I was extremely suspicious. And unfortunately, he managed to convince a few other of our activists to be part of the journey. And they drove to Swaziland. And in a particular dark spot in Swaziland, they were ambushed and brutally killed by the security forces. And, 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 and if I had agreed to go on that trip that Saturday morning, I would be history today. I would have been part of those people who were killed. In the, in the Truth Commission submissions, um, the security branch actually did confirm that, in fact, they had a project called Project Cobra, which was to actually assassinate student leaders in a Zanian student organization, my organization, and the Congress of South African Students, COSAS. So the mission was to take us out of the country into Swaziland and kill us in the bush uh, and give whatever reasons they wanted to give. So that's, that's how basically I survived, by refusing to get into that car with that particular comrade. Mm. It sounds like blind luck, but um, I do think it's also that finely tuned, in tuneness with, with your surroundings and with knowing that something is off. And you describe it quite well in your book. And I find it a characteristic of you later in life as well. All of these things um, maybe ensure that you are the pe person that you are now, where you could have spotted this trap and you spotted other traps in life too. Um, Going on from that to the third theme, but still taking betrayal and still taking spotting the trouble ahead of time with us, how difficult can it be in government? Um, you were the DG at Public Works and you describe your own failures. Um, you talk about the Genadendal carpets. You talk about Judge Satchwell in court and how she uh, invited you to come and look at the devastation. You talk about the military hospital and the weeds growing and the state of affairs there. Um, even even someone like yourself, who, uh, who were trying to do the right thing, who were working within a certain structure, had to acknowledge that there were certain failures. Absolutely. I mean, the point to make is that I mean, the government system is quite huge. If we take... Um, the public works department, as an example, I mean, we were spending no less than 8 billion rands a year in our budget to maintain public facilities, to run a public works program, et cetera, et cetera. And the department was very efficient in spending each and every cent that was allocated to us by National Treasury. And unfortunately, there was nothing to show for it. Uh, public facilities, courts, school uh, uh, prisons, uh, government offices, ministerial houses, all of those things were still in a state of disrepair, despite the fact that we're spending billions of rand. So it was a, 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 a sense of failure that I was feeling at the time, that here am I being part of this department, spending money, but having to go to parliament all the time to be held accountable. And I would say, yes, we are spending the money, but there wasn't anything to show for it. So it was a, a, a challenge that we, we, we faced all, all the time. And I think that it's, it's, it's very sad that, in fact, a lot of the challenges that we're still facing now that are still existing in government today, things that we, we ex experienced more than 20 years ago, and we should have been on top of it. But because of the leadership changes that we're experiencing, there's very little progress that you can point out to say public works is now a better department, is doing all the mistakes that Patricia Delil is talking about now are things that I experienced when of the of the department, and it, it's, it's, it's still said that we have not come on top of it. Mm, okay, so I hear you when you say, it, again, it's structural problems and people not um, in the job for long enough. But isn't it also a matter of repercussions? Isn't it also a matter of, I need to do my job very well and do the right thing, otherwise I will have to explain why I may go to jail. I cannot be corrupt because there will be repercussions. Or am I wrong? I like what the the new Auditor General is actually trying to do because she's now beginning to introduce an element of um, accountability on the part of government officials. So she's basically saying if there is unauthorized expenditure in a department, people must be held accountable. And, and 
I think that's one of the things that we didn't have at the time. It was enough for government officials to go to parliament and say, yes, we didn't do this, yes, we didn't do that, and it will be end of the story. But I think with this framework, what, with the Auditor General now, I think there's a greater chance of actually people being held accountable. But you can hold people accountable if you don't solve the prior problem, in my view, and that is making sure that the right people get appointed into the right positions, as especially director generals of department, very little will, will actually happen, change will happen, because we need to move away from a situation where people are appointed by ministers because they are seen to be un amenable to what the minister will ask them to do as soon as they get appointed. So we have a, sh a skills shortage that exists in the public service today, largely because skilled people have the public service, the public service is now facing a major challenge of recruiting the right kind of people into the right kind of jobs to make sure that we we actually achieve the goals that we want to achieve as, as a nation. But in my view, consequence management, holding people account accountable is going to be important. And finally, this whole question of uh, security of tenure. I mean, if director generals are appointed for only three years in, in the job, let me tell you, it takes more than 18 months for somebody in charge of a large department such as public works to fully understand which levers to turn if you want things to change. And at the end of that 18 month period, when you're beginning to understand what your job is about, your term is just about to end. So I think that government needs to also review this shortened period of employment for DGs, give people security of tenure so that they can sit comfortably and know that in fact they've got five years to achieve certain goals and to turn a department around within a matter of uh, three years in my view is is a pipe dream it can't be done mm. and maybe as you say employ someone who really can do the job and not try to circulate um, the people in government at the moment we have so many bright stars in the public sector and the private sector um, and we should make use of them and then yeah. as you make the point in your book the tenure of three years is just not something that someone in a cushy job in private sector will accept uh, when they get invited to to the public arena so Ufense Pashoko asks do you think the current administration is doing everything they can to save our country and combat corruption I think there are good things that this government is trying to do. Um, one of the things we've just talked about now is consequence management, and that is holding people accountable, prosecuting somebody who's guilty of corruption. And, and I think that will go a long way if we can begin to see people such as a minister or a senior government official, a CEO of a state-owned enterprise being arrested and wearing orange overalls in prison for corruption it will begin to send a signal. Some of the things that the new government is doing is to strengthen the National Prosecuting Authority because that's where, during the state capture period, a lot of damage was done. The capacity of that agency was actually reduced to a point where prosecutions cannot be done. I think that the government is doing the right thing in appointing the right people, qualified lawyers, qualified accountants, and making sure that, in fact, people who are accused of corruption can be prosecuted. So I think that government is is on the right track. Um, yeah, I think that um, I, I have confidence that in fact uh, we are on a on the right path of fixing all the errors that went wrong over the past uh, decade or so. Mm. So we can certainly perhaps proffer that argument when we look at all the cases being heard all the money being frozen by the Special Investigation Unit, by the latest conviction from the prosecuting authority. Um, mm. But how can we make that argument when the SIU and the NPA's budgets are cut? That's, that's a very unfortunate thing. And, and, and I understand why maybe some government tends to do that, because there are serious budget constraints. This government, largely because of the theft, the thieving that took place, over the, de the past decade or so, government does not have the cash. So they have to strike a balance between providing money for services such as education, health, water, housing, fixing potholes in the roads, but at the same time building capacity of the state
to fight corruption. So it's a, it's a difficult balance to, to, to strike. Um, and it will be difficult for more money to be taken away from education, for example, and put that into the SIU. Both things have to be done and it's a striking balance. I, I don't envy the officials at National Treasury because they have to make these allocations, but get rid of corruption, then we will go back to the good old days where we were even talking about the budget sur surplus in, in the state coffers. But unfortunately, we are in a, a budget crisis as a nation and some balancing act still has to be done. But I believe that in fact, uh, the little that the additional that has been put into S S the SIU, the NPA is still equally important because we have to improve services on the one hand, but at the same time, we have to make sure that those who still from the, the coffers of the state are held accountable. They are arrested, prosecuted, and their assets are seized as a matter of priority. Mm, you're speaking like the good government spokesperson you once was, I think. Um, Andy China asks, I engage with many who say that justice doesn't work, so why bother to report corruption? Temba, what do you think needs to change to ensure speedier justice? Well, it, it, it's what we've just discussed. I mean, we have to improve the capacity of the state to investigate all acts of corruption. And I know, I know a lot of people are worried and complaining about the amount of money that is being spent on, for example, the Zondo Commission. But it's important for us, if we want to get to the bottom of fighting corruption, we've got to understand how the networks operated. And that's what the Zondo Commission is actually explaining to us, the relationship between politicians and corrupt business people, the extent to which appointments to state-owned enterprises, ESCOM, Transnet, etc., to boards, took place so that the corrupt or certain people are appointed into those boards to facilitate the thieving that took place during the period of, of state capture. So a lot of those things actually help us understand how the state capture project was managed, how it ran, so that we can put measures in place to, to prevent it in future. But in, in the short term, I'm convinced that in fact, the work that's being done by the prosecuting authority, by the Hawks, is progress in the right direction. We'll see results maybe in a few months time. It may take even longer than that. But the fact of the matter is that thieves out there know that in fact, the wheels of justice are starting to turn, maybe too slow, but they're starting to turn. And I remain confident that in fact, those who are responsible for this capture project will be held accountable and they will and should end up in orange overalls. Mm. Okay, um, you in your book, um, you sort of summarize what we've just discussed very mm. eloquently. Um, I think it's something that I should read out loud on page 125 for those of you who already has the book, just a reminder, it's for my country. Um, Tate Temba, you say you review the, the, the last 10 years, as it's recently being labelled. Um, and you you summarise it quite well. You say, under Zuma, Cabinet Lakota has run like clockwork because all ministerial clusters soon realised that everything they presented would be approved. Before that, um, in your book, you described how Mbeki really scrutinised and prepared um, for all sessions and how he often caught off guard several directors general or ministers um, not knowing what they're talking about or not knowing enough, um, sending them back to the drawing board. And with Zuma, it was just not the same. Um, you say further, I sensed that the voices of directors general were, grow were getting quieter or slightly muted as challenging or disagreeing with the newly appointed ministers could lead to their contracts being terminated. There was an unprecedented exit of skilled people, which was enough to worry anyone who was concerned about service delivery issues. And then later in, on in the book on page 128, you say, it was sad to see the revolution being derailed in this manner by people who once belonged to the liberation movement. Now, these are people who fought like you, um, who went through many of the same things like you, who slept on the ground like you, but they are not looking at education like you are now. They're not looking at corruption like you are now. They're not looking at a government who's supposed to be effective like you are. Why is there that discrepancy? I think we, 
we 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 went through a tough time. I mean, the the, the Mbeki administration, and I'm sure there was corruption then. I'm, I'm not suggesting otherwise. The single-mindedness of President Mbeki was 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 just admirable. Um, he was a taskmaster, he made master, and he made sure that he he led government by by example. So he governance to him was everything. Was more than just being wearing a nice suit and driving a, a fancy car. So a lot of us, directors general and ministers, knew that when there was a cabinet, Lekhutla, for example, coming, we had to literally spend half the night in the office making sure that you do your homework, you prepare thoroughly, because when you present, maybe we'll be sitting there and you'll have to show and demonstrate that, in fact, you know what you're talking about. But when he, 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 he unceremoniously left the public service, then things started changing. I mean, the culture became totally different. Um, um, they, I did not feel the same sense of agency to do the right things. So preparing for cabinet Mahotlas became just another job you present. And I don't recall a time when any of the government proposals or programs that were presented were ever rejected because not enough detail was put into it or not enough thinking had gone to preparing for them. So you, you got a sense that, in fact, the, the, the governance model that was in place wasn't continuing to yield the kind of results that we were actually looking for. And then I got a sense that, you know, there was a new generation of people coming into government, especially at a political level, people who were driven by a mentality such as it's our time to eat, uh, as somebody put it also in the continent. So it was people who are coming into government, firstly, who wanted to sort out all of those who were seen to be part of the, the Mbeki faction. So a lot of civil servants uh, exited the system uh, during that period. So any attempt by a director general and official to give advice that is seen to be contrary to a minister or a group of ministers led to isolation and possible exit of some of those government officials. So you got a sense that the, the vision that drove us when we got into government in 1994 was starting to, to disappear. People were driven by other motives of trying to make sure that they have better and stronger levers uh, of, of power, especially with regard to the control of resources. And that's when the the, the, the roots of state capture started emerging because people saw government as, as, a, as a platform to actually start siphoning out resources for their own pockets. That is a very important sentence you just said, um, because what you're essentially arguing is that people changed over time from being the liberators to being the people who stood for their own pockets and who wanted to make money off of government and off of the people without ensuring that the people are okay. And that brings us right into the Zuma era, how people stood up for the president at the time, how they uh, defended them him with their buttocks even. Um, and it leads us right into that first call from AJ Gupta to you in 2016. Tell us about that. Well, I had met Ajay Gupta when he was a board member of what was then the International Marketing Council, the IMC, now called the Brand SA, and I had had one or two conversations with him. And then he tried, after that IMC discussion, he then tried to make contact with me to say he needs to have a meeting with me to discuss the establishment of a media company. So I tried to ignore him for a while because I, there were already rumors at the time that in fact, he was up to no good using his connections with Zuma to actually access government contracts. I avoided him for quite a while, but he was persistent to a point where I eventually agreed to meet him. And he insisted that the meeting must take place at his home, the, the famous sex, sex and world, uh, Shabin. And I just I agreed to meet him there. On my way to the meeting, I then get a call from President Zuma to say there are these Gupta brothers who need my help. I must actually go and help them. So I go to the meeting. In the meeting, that's when Ajay Gupta demands that I, I take the whole government budget to him, to his company, so that they could communicate government messages better. And I said, no, no, that's not how it's done in government. And, and I explained the detail in the book. So the meeting ended abruptly 
without me agreeing. And I knew at the time that in fact, there was no way I would go around talking to government departments, taking all their money and sending it to, to, to the Gupta company. And in any case, I did not have the authority to do so. So that was the end of the story. And then closer to the date, this was in 2010, closer to the date of the launch of his first pro project, which was the, the New Age newspaper, he, I then get a call from one of his lieutenants, Tony, demanding a, on a Friday evening, demanding a meeting with me on a Monday morning. And I tell him, listen, I, my Monday is full, but call me on Monday and we'll set up an appointment. He insisted and I told him, I'm not gonna agree to that. A few minutes later, I then get a call from IJ Gupta himself. Uh, basically telling me that his people tell him that I'm not cooperative and, and that he was insisting that in fact uh, the meeting should happen. And in fact, he said the meeting will no longer take place on Monday, it will take place the following day, which was a Saturday. And I told him, RJ, I'm out of town. There's no way I can meet you tomorrow. And he said, listen, you're gonna meet, meet me on Saturday. And I, I told him, I'm not gonna meet you. And in fact, I told him that there were government officials who own newspapers who never had the audacity to even call me and give me an instruction. And at the end of that conversation, he told me that I did not understand what was going on. And he was going to speak to my superiors and make sure that I'm sorted out and they'll get somebody who will be more cooperative uh, with them. And at that point, that's when I, I, I think I said something like he must go uh, uh, fuck himself or something like that, something unpalatable like that. But that was the end of the conversation. But importantly, the tone of the call was somebody who knew that he had authority over me. It was an instruction. It wasn't a conversation, and that's what I found totally, totally unacceptable. And by and at that point, I decided I'm not going to cooperate with him. But I knew that in in doing so and saying so, I was going to make somebody unhappy, and that is Zuma, because he's the man who had called me to say I must help the the Gupta brothers. So that's how that conversation actually uh, unfolded. So Temba, let's read that uh, that heated conversation as you recount it in your book. You say here um, that you were on your way to Sun City on the road. Your wife was sitting next to you. Yep. And Tony Gupta phones you, uh, fob him off and says, you know, we'll talk on Monday. And then AJ phones, which was the big enforcer of the family. Um, and AJ at one stage says to you, Listen to me carefully, okay? I'm telling you that the meeting will take place tomorrow morning. You say, now you listen to me, AJ. You can't give me an instruction to meet you tomorrow because I don't work for you. And AJ says, no, you listen. I will not tolerate any nonsense from you because you don't understand what's going on. I will speak to your superiors and tell them to replace you with someone who will be willing to cooperate. And then you say, you can go fuck yourself then. I don't work for you. Someone um, who will cooperate was then actually parachuted into your job. Um, and it brings us right back to betrayal and um, the changing of mood within the ANC, where Colin Shabani, your superior at the time, said when you complained, he said it would be very difficult to raise such a sensitive issue with the president. Don't you think he should have actually just done that? And isn't that one of the reasons why we got ourselves into that position is because everyone thought, sure, that's a bit sensitive. We can't really tell the president no. Polly, you know, the difficulty with that period was the fact that if there was any problem or challenge either in government or in the ruling party, the right person to go to is the president to complain about what some business people were, were doing to you. Whereas in this particular case, I mean, in my case, the issue was about the president himself and, and, and his friends, and clearly people were using their connections with Zuma himself, the Gupta brothers. So it was possible, it was in fact not possible for me to go to Zuma and say, listen, your friends are, are doing this because in fact he was the one who was in a sense, who had given me the instruction to actually help them out. So interestingly, when I was defying Ajay Gupta and refusing to cooperate with them, I continued to be in the same space with Zuma. We sat in cabinet meetings. I, mean, I was sitting literally, he was sitting literally above me. And at no stage did he say, did he speak to Ajay 
are you helping them? He just kept quiet and, and, and ignored me completely, refused to have meetings with me in my capacity as CEO of GCIS and, and government spokesperson. And I raised the matter with my superior, advised by prominent people in government, such as your, your friend Chikane and other ANC leaders. And Collins Chabane was at pains to say, listen, he's gonna try and speak to the president about the, about the matter, but I could tell just from the tone of his vase, voice and looking at his eyes, that this was a, a, a difficult challenge that he had. Uh, he, 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 for instance, when he received the instruction from Zuma to remove me from GCIS, he, he said he was he did not agree with this decision. He'll try and talk to the president, but at the end of the day, I must understand that Zuma was his boss and he has to implement that instruction. But it just demonstrated the fact that at the time, Zuma was a very powerful person within the ANC and also within government. And I, I suspect that even ANC leaders who knew the problems basically feared the man and could not actually confront him on the issue of the, the, the Guptas and the uh, shenanigans with, with government departments and SOEs. Mm, and so everyone kept tiptoeing around the president and um, now we find ourselves in the current situation, which is Absolutely. very undesirable. Shouldn't we, I'm going to repeat that question, shouldn't we have been stricter with the president at the time? I think that I was most disappointed by parliament, uh, but clearly Zuma had a firm hold over the ANC caucus in parliament. Um, and, and MPs saw, and very senior politicians, including ministers, did not have doubts or hesitate to stand up in parliament and defend Zuma for all kinds of things. I mean, we, we remember the, that, that whole embarrassing swimming pool briefing by a number of ministers who were defending expenditure in, in, in Kandla. So people, Zuma surrounded himself with people who not only supported him, but also feared him, and therefore did everything to make sure that they, they defended him. The ANC, ANC, NEC, I think, could have played a, a much different role uh, because not all NEC members were in cabinet. So in a sense, you'd expect them to be more objective and, and make sure that they raise challenges that exist out there. But the ANC itself was a disappointment, largely because, again, Zuma was too powerful and nobody could actually raise their voices. But credit goes to civil society organizations. Um, and I, I might say opposition parties also stood up. The media, people like yourselves, played a key role in making sure that all these issues of concern were raised. Business leaders also at a later stage started realizing that something was going terribly wrong. And that's when we started seeing movements emerging Save South Africa campaign, for example, where ordinary citizens took to the streets and said, this far and no further. So South Africa did wake up, but by the time we all wake, woke up, a bit of damage had been done in the state system, and that's why we're sitting where we are today. Mm, a bit of damage. I think that's being kind. <laughs> so um, I want to move on to whistleblowers. Um, mm. uh, and the symptoms that you describe are the classic symptoms of someone who, by conviction of them feeling this is the right thing to do, um, they found themselves in a situation which they didn't actually see themselves as whistleblowers to start off with, later realized, okay, I can be seen as a whistleblower, and then having to deal with that blowback, having to deal with being a pariah in your own organization that you actually fought for, uh, to, to, to get into power, that you find yourself um, without friends in your movement, where you find yourself without being able to get a job, um, where you find yourself out in the cold, literally, as the ANC say, it's cold outside the ANC, um, and you find yourself in financial trouble, you find yourself depressed, you find yourself isolated um, in in real life, as in not seeing people, but also in your mind. Tell us about whistleblowers um, and how difficult it is to be in that position. Polly, I must say that, I mean, I had moments as I was writing this 
book where I could feel tears in my eyes uh, because of how strongly I felt about some of those, these things. And the issue of whistle blowing, when I, when I got to the chapter, I spent literally days debating whether I should write about this or not. And the reason being that, you know, on the one hand, it's important for society to know what whistleblowers go through. But on the other hand, you want to think and worry about if you tell the truth and if you give too much detail, what message are potential whistleblowers going to receive from that? In other words, are people going to be scared to speak out because they don't want to go through what a, a massacre went through? So it was a taxing time for me, but I, it's a chapter that ultimately my publisher and I said, we can't live up, we have to include that. But it was, a, it was a, a very taxing period for me, the, the, iso the political isolation. And I relate a story of attending a funeral of Ronnie Mamuyapa, an old comrade of mine from the UDF days who was also in government. Uh, I arrived at the parking lot, met lots of uh, my former colleagues and comrades and everybody was able to talk to me. But as we were walking closer to the venue, most of those people found something to do or other people to talk to. And I found myself walking alone into the hall. And I could tell that, you know, people were very uncomfortable to be seen next to me because I was a pariah or an enemy of the state. So you, you get a sense that politically you are isolated, you are unwelcome, but not that people don't support what you do. They whisper to your ear to say, well done start my man but in public they did not want to be seen to be associating with me because they feared that if they are seen to be too close to me they'll be seen to be supporting me and and they will get into or experience other problems in their work environments then there are financial pressures that you you go through you, you your cash runs out um, you access you get you you invade your access bonds you invade your life policies you basically taking money from your future and the, your kids' future just to make ends meet. You, you get used to visiting pawn shops to pawn a, a cell phone or your motor vehicle just to pay bills for a particular period of time. Um, your phone stops ringing. Uh, you can't sleep at night. You, 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 you wake up in the morning dreading how you're going to spend the rest of your day you fear the night because you know at night you can sleep, you can eat, and you resort to things like visiting alcohol from time to time just to cope. Uh, fortunately, I, had a, I tried to have a stronger will. I participated, I went to gym every day, I played golf, I did this and that. But at the end of the day, there's a family to wake up to, to face each and every day. And, and, and the difficulty is that, you know, we don't, always prepare our families for the consequences of being a whistleblower. Uh, and that's because we don't think enough about the consequences, but it affects your family, it affects your kids, it affects your wife. So it is a very, very difficult uh, space to be in, but equally it's an important space to be because without whistleblowers, generally such as yourself, will have very little information to confirm uh, the shenanigans that are taking place in government. So whistleblowers, are very important in society. I, I have to share the stories about private sector not willing to even look at your CV. You submit your CV, it goes to the bottom drawer, you can't get jobs. You try to start a business, look for funding, and you attend an ex a politically exposed person because your name is in the media all the time. So you can't start a business, you can't start a job. So life becomes difficult. So whistleblowers need to know that these are challenges. What the country's responsibility is to ensure that measures are put in place to support whistleblowers because if we don't then shenanigans corruption will continue uh, unabated and people can do things in a sophisticated way that unless a whistleblower speaks the country will never get to know about those things so i think that we have a, a duty a responsibility to support whistleblowers by changing legislation by getting society to be aware that whistleblowers need support. Uh, I can't stop, I can't finish here without saying that I also got a lot of support from just ordinary members of society. I bump into people in the streets, in the malls, and they pat my back and say, you don't know me, but well done, and thank you for what you've done. 
and that gave me motivation and obviously support from family was was very important and a few friends of course okay um i have time for one question and i want to focus on you and whistleblowers give me three things Temba, that would have helped you if you had it at the time when you started playing the whistle, it would have made all the difference. Three things that society and government needs to change to help people like you, Cynthia Stimple, Musile Motepo, those people who comes out with the gory details. Look, only three. <laughs> the first thing, obviously, I think we need to look at legislation to make sure that whistleblowers are protected. Um, but it's not enough because at the moment, the, the, the legislation simply protects you from a labor relations perspective that you can't be fired if you blow the whistle and, and et cetera. Secondly, society needs to, our country needs to come up with a way of supporting whistleblowers um, with their, edu their kids' education um, and making sure that they can actually survive from day to day. And thirdly, talking about private sector needs to come to the party. I think that they, they have a, a major role to play in making sure that they support and, and offer work opportunities for those who can remain in the public service uh, to, to work in the, in, the, in, the, in the private sector. But whistleblowers in the private sector also face challenges, similar challenges. So in a sense, you, you're thinking that one of the ways in which business can actually support the, the whistleblower movement is supporting entities, civil society organizations, whose job is to support whistleblowers to make sure that um, they fund those civil society organizations to support whistleblowers. Whistleblowers blowing requires a lot of legal support in a lot of instances. Now, if you're without a job, without income, you can't even get a lawyer. And some of the whistleblowers get intimidated by their employers, be it in government or private sector. So they end up having to go to courts or preparing affidavits and all kinds of things. They need legal support. So that kind of support, I think, is absolutely vital. And lastly, making sure that as a whistleblower, you make sure that you've got your family on your corner. Talk to them before you go out in public, because at the end of the day, you need family support to survive each and every day. So letting your family know what you are about to do, what it means, and making sure that everybody in your family is on board. I think that's absolutely vital. Mm. That is such an important discussion and I'm sorry to say that our time is, is uh, done now. Thank you Temba Maseko for taking us through your journey to help us understand how you became the man that you are. Um, and thank you for blowing the whistle and, and ensuring that in your own way, you worked for yet again a better country. Um, thank you then for the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung for supporting us and Temba to ensure that we can host this webinar. And thank you again for the Maverick Insiders. You are special to us and we appreciate you. Good day. Okay.